with monitoring gas exchange in that space. And actually, I think that that is a very wide topic for 15 minutes. So I will be talking mainly about that space. And my contention here is once again to try to stress the point that dead space is one of the major reasons, is a major generator of ventilator induced lung injury. These are my conflict of interest, and I did this a slide I like very much. It's a slide from the original six against 12 milliliters per kilo study, which showed that, that patients ventilated with six milliliters per kilo survived more than those ventilated 12 milliliters per kilo. And as a matter of fact, if we look at minute ventilation, which is total ventilation, we see that both the, the low tidal volume and high tidal volume were ventilated crazy numbers, 13 liters per minute, while the normal ventilation at rest is between five, five and six liters per minute. So we should ask ourselves why patients with the RDS are ventilated 13 liters per minute, 12, I've seen 15 also. And that is because of that space. And the more we ventilate, the higher the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury. Even in spontaneous breathing, we learned. So it's not ventilator, it's ventilation-induced lung injury. So this is an excellent lung, an ideal lung. And we have uh, three regions, three samples uh, of the lung. We have an anatomical dead space of the airways, which do not participate to the gas exchange. In, in a normal subject with a normal respiratory rate, this amounts to approximately two liters per minute. The, now, we have each one of the regions receives two liters per minute. The PCO2 is 43, the lung is perfect, the arterial PCO2 is 43. Now, now we have uh, a problem. One of the region is not ventil is not perfused. So now we have two leaders that do not participate to, to gas exchange, which is the anatomical dead space. And one of the three regions does not get ex exchange gas because not being supplied by blood, there is no CO2 to exchange. This is wasted ventilation. It is ventilation that does not take out CO2 and does not bring oxygen to blood because blood is not there. Now, the other two regions work perfectly, and the PO, PCO2 is again 43 inside the alveoli that work, and this 43 in the artery. It means that if we go and measure the expired CO2, the expired CO2 will be a mixture between the alveolar dead space, the anatomical dead space, and the gas coming from the normally perfused alveoli. Will be, 
the expired CO2 will be lower than 43. But most importantly, the ventilation in the alveoli had to be increased to remove the same amount of CO2 because we waste two liters. So ventilation has moved, has moved from six to eight. And if we maintain the same respiratory rate, the alveolar pressure has increased one third. The driving pressure has been increased 30%, let's say from 20 to 27. But now I have a patient with the RDS, he has shunt. And one of the regions is not ventilated, but perfused. So the blood, blood coming out has the same PO2 and PCO2 of the mixed venous. So the arterial now is a mixture from the blood coming from the well-ventilated alveoli and the non-ventilated alveoli. If I want to have the same arterial PCO2, I have to <coughs> decrease the PCO2 of the well-ventilated and well-perfused <coughs> sorry, and well-perfused regions. I have to have <coughs> a 33 milliliters <coughs> of mercury in the well-perfused alveoli so that when we mix the gas, thank you. When we mix the gas, the blood coming from the well-ventilated region with the shunted blood will have 43. But it means that I, that I still have to further increase ventilation if I want to have 35 of PCO2 in the alveoli. And now the total ventilation has become 12 liters because I have to increase the ventilation of the dead space, the ventilation of the alveolar dead space, and the ventilation of the ideal space because I cannot direct ventilation where I want. I have to increase total ventilation. And now you see, if you like to make computations, you see that the presence of shunt has a, a fake dead space effect because <coughs> the difference between the entidal CO2 and the arterial CO2 has increased once more. So the concept here is that <coughs> if we have dead space, we have to increase ventilation. And increasing ventilation increases the risk of Vili. But it's not only that. It's not simply that we have to increase ventilation and increasing ventilation increases the risk. I will show you that <coughs> the ventilation of the dead space damages the lung tissue. <coughs> this is the relationship between dead space and mortality. The higher the measured dead space, the higher the mortality. These are data that have been replicated many, many times. This is a paper from 2002. It shows <coughs> that exactly what I told you. The higher the dead space, the higher the mortality. What the reason of the dead space is vascular occlusion. We have learned that the RDS is the occupation of the alveoli. It's an alveolar disease. But it has also a vascular side because inflammation 
leads to microvascular occlusion. And you see here in your uh, left a normal lung, normal vascular tree. On the right, you see a, a pruned vascular tree generating a high dead space. And the vascular occlusion caused, causes also a pulmonary artery hypertension, as, which is a normal, <coughs> normal characteristic of ARDS. ARDSs usually have high pulmonary artery pressure. And somebody has even used, used uh, fibrinolytics to decrease the pulmonary artery pressure. It's not been done very often, but it has been done. And the effect is that the pulmonary artery pressure goes down. The increase in pulmonary artery pressure contributes to open normally silent intrapulmonary shunts, which in turn further decrease oxygenation. We have uh, recently with the COVID-19, we have had a, re <coughs> a revival. <coughs> I'm incubating something very bad. <coughs> there is a fog inside here. Uh, the COVID-19 <coughs> has, has shown a lot of intravascular occlusion. We, we have done uh, CT scan and angiography in many, many, there are many, many papers showing that. So dead space is caused by microvascular disease associated to ARDS. And this microvascular disease contributes to the generation of ventilator-induced lung injury. The higher the dead space, the higher the ventilator-induced lung injury. But now I want to show you the last part of this re way of reasoning, that ventilating dead space is bad. Uh, we know that CO2 CO2 hypercapnia in some experimental conditions protects from ventila experimental ventilator induced lung injury. And, uh, and uh, the group of in Toronto, <coughs> John Laffey, Brian Kavanagh, have, have published a lot of evidence about this. <coughs> Obviously, hypercapnia is not good, has many side effects besides protecting from ventilator-induced lung injury. This is a very old paper from uh, the late 60s. It is an experiment in dogs. By tying off the, pulmon the left pulmonary artery, the left lung becomes hemorrhagic if we keep ventilating it. <coughs> if we add 5% CO2 to the inhaled gas, the lung is protected, does not get hemorrhagic. This is from the laboratory of Ted Kolobov at NIH, published in 81. I did not do these experiments, but I was there when this paper was published. And the reasoning here was that the, dead, the ventilated dead space, not having blood supply, gets very alkalotic, PCO2 very close to zero. And PCO2 very close to zero means no pH buffering. And if we look at papers concerning cellular growth, cellular culture in vitro, you, you, you will notice that most of the cellular uh, cultures require 3 to 5% CO2 in the gas phase. 
Otherwise, there is no bicarbonate. And pH is extremely alkalotic. We repeated the experiment in pigs, thanks to our friend <coughs> Tommaso Mauri. We ligated the left artery, pulmonary artery of the pig. And as you can see, against control, both the right and the left lung get a RDS <coughs> and hemorrhagic pulmonary edema. I have no time to discuss the mechanism of that besides the alkalosis of the non-perfused lung, but hmm, when we ventilate with 5% CO2, the left lung, which is not perfused, comes out very good, and the right lung <coughs> is also protected. So, the end of this reasoning is that inhaling 5% CO2 protects the ventilated dead space from ventilator-induced lung injury and from inflammation that damages also the, the other lung, which is, which, is, uh, which is perfused. And how can we... What is the idea? At the end, the idea is that we could do an experiment during ECMO, because in ECMO, we can ventilate with 5% CO2 and maintain a normal CO2, because we have a machine that removes the CO2. We can do protective ventilation using 5% CO2 with normal, with normocapnia. And I think that this is a possibility that will allow super protective ventilation during ECMO. Because as long as we ventilate dead space regions, we will contribute to the generation of Vili. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Antonio. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, we are at the end of the session, so that was a, a great session. Thank you to all the speakers and uh, the attendants. Thank you.